I recently released a video about obesity, the many factors that influence it, and the challenges that impede effective treatment. Shortly thereafter, I shared my video with one of Canada's leading experts on the topic, Dr. Yoni Friedhoff, Associate Professor of Family Medicine at the University of Ottawa and Medical Director of the Bariatric Medical Center, which specializes in non-surgical weight management programs. He graciously took the time to critique my video. It's horrible. Absolute F tier. And offer insight on my podcast, and I'll be sharing some of the key points from that interview today. Yanni has plenty of first hand experience with obesity and will help to deepen our understanding of this chronic, non communicable disease as well as its treatment. Knowledge and strategies to apply it across the incredibly complex landscape of our lives, coupled with realistic expectations and medical interventions, are invaluable tools that can support us in making lasting change. As such, I am grateful to medical professionals like Yanni who are eager to educate about these topics. His programs are sustainable, individually tailored, medically supervised to ensure safety, and he does not hide behind weight loss gimmicks. I like this excerpt from his website. Much like telling someone that they should buy low, sell high to make money in the stock market, telling someone to eat less Exercise more for weight loss has little value. Utilizing the latest research, our staff of health professionals work with you one-on-one -on -one to guide you using the most effective methods of weight management. The philosophy for us has always been really simple. Um, Weight-wise, your best weight is whatever weight you reach when you're living the healthiest life you, you can enjoy. And that's what everything sort of comes back to. And it really varies between individuals and even within individuals. And I think that really, embracing that that it's not about a particular number but rather it's about the road and not the destination is crucial when we're talking about something like weight management where there are so many factors that are wholly beyond our available levers of control this clip is actually from the end of our interview yanni's closing statement if you will but i think it sets the stage for everything we're about to cover Whatever weight you reach when you're living the healthiest life you can enjoy is an incredibly nutrient dense statement and has far reaching implications for each individual. Before we dive in, the full interview will be available on my Dr. Chris podcast channel shortly. And if you're interested in learning more, Yanni also has a YouTube channel where he shares his knowledge on some important topics. The mythology of modern day dieting, some of the deceptive advertising that the food industry tends to use and public policy when it comes to nutrition and weight management. I'll leave a link to his channel down below. Now, I hope you've got your pen and paper or alternative note taking device in hand because there is a lot to digest in this conversation. When I reached out to you about feedback on the video, um, you talked a little bit about privilege. Tell me, how does privilege uh, play a role in dealing with obesity? I think what people forget many times is that when we're talking about lifestyle specifically and it's an impact on obesity presumably to help people lose weight and maintain that weight loss it's an intentional behavior change that is required in perpetuity around something that is challenging consequent to millions of years of evolution we have uh, thousands literally thousands of genes dozens of hormones involved in the regulation of different behaviors that associate with weight our levels of hunger, our levels of craving, uh, our fullness levels. How long does it take us to feel full? How long do we feel full for? And to the emotional impact of food. So food absolutely has an emotional impact for all of us. It decreases our body's cortisol levels. But I think for some people, it has more of an impact and more of a benefit. I bring up all those things because we are talking about something that is not as straightforward as, well, just eat less and move more. And I'm not suggesting you were saying that. You weren't. Um, but I think that Taking a step even further back, I think about the people that I work with in my practice. So we run a couple of programs that are funded by the Ministry of Health. So there's no cost to people. And as a consequence, we're not just seeing people who can afford to come in and say hi. Uh, we're seeing everybody from all over the place. And especially with the pandemic and virtual care, we're really getting a glimpse into people's lives uh, from a different perspective than we did before. And I can tell you that the amount of privilege required to intentionally change your behavior around food and fitness forever um, is really high. A very important point. I feel like Yanni does an excellent job here introducing us to the complex relationship between obesity and privilege. As I reflect upon our conversation, I'm struck by the many ways privilege could influence a person's ability to sustain lifestyle change. The world is, is a hard place. It's a very difficult place, whether it's uh, we have our own medical concerns and issues. 
whether we are providing care for a child or a parent who is struggling with their health or mental health or physical health, whether we have chronic pain, whether we have financial concerns, whether we have time concerns, whether we even have kitchens and gyms and access to things to make these changes is not a given. And so sometimes I feel like the discussion around weight management specifically forgets that. And it just assumes that everybody, if they just wanted it badly enough, would make it happen and forget that food has many roles beyond just nutrition. Mm -hmm. um, food plays a role in every aspect of our lives. For some people, it may be one of the very few consistent pleasures that they have. I mean, when you put it that way, can you imagine asking someone in a difficult life circumstance to give up one of the few consistent pleasures that they have? Or telling someone to just crank out a workout after 12 plus hours on the job when they still have young children to put to bed? And here we are saying that you need to be able not only to sort of deal with this on your own, but also to swim against the current of those millions of years of evolution that have created a circumstance where in this modern day food environment, the default is gain. And uh, that's not to say people can't affect changes through lifestyle, people can. It's just that the assumption that if someone isn't doing so, that they are doing that as a choice, where I would argue that for a very large percentage of people, that choice is a luxury they literally do not have. Tell them, Yoni. I'm stopping here because some things need to be repeated. The assumption that people are choosing not to change their lifestyle is not sensitive to the fact that said choice is a luxury that some do not have. What's that? Facts? And of course, we must consider the role of genes and hormones in determining one's weight. In addition to the stuff we've already touched on, time, skill sets, money, health, wellness, etc. And then there are the genes. We know, again, thousands of genes, dozens of hormones. And sadly, we aren't at a place yet. We probably will be one day. We're just not at a place yet where I could run a panel of, of tests and say, oh, you've got this gene, this gene, this gene. So your struggles are a consequence of this pathway, that pathway, and the other pathway. And here is either a pharmaceutical treatment or a lifestyle change that's gonna make it better. Again, I do believe that that is the primary driver for the vast majority of people are things that are wholly beyond their control. The more we learn, the more apparent it becomes. You nobody chooses this. So mm. this is not a choice people make. Later on, Yanni references a study that really drives this point home. For context, I had just finished describing two of my patients with obesity who both underwent gastric bypass surgery around the same time, but for whom the procedure had very different results. One regained much of the weight while the other did not. Although the study he references pertains to bariatric surgery patients specifically, I felt it highlighted the degree to which obesity can affect a person's quality of life. So the patient you're describing did not choose to regain a whole bunch sure. more weight. This was not a choice. Yep. And I'll tell you actually, looking at bariatric surgical patients specifically, um, there was a study done that looked at whether a person would rather uh, lose their vision, get cancer, lose a limb, or gain their weight back after bariatric surgery. Mm -hmm. And Uniformly, they would rather one of those other things than to gain their weight back. So the impact weight has on a person's health and quality of life who chooses to undergo bariatric surgery is very high. That being said, Yanni then reminds us that obesity must be considered on a case by case basis, as there are people who are not concerned about their weight and for whom it does not impact their quality of life so directly. Just because obesity can affect a person's quality of life doesn't mean that it actually does. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean everybody with a high weight has uh, significant medical or quality of life concerns. His nuanced understanding of the disease trickles down to his one-on-one -on -one patient interactions, where he is both sensitive to risks and benefits associated with the condition and respectful of how the patient feels in regards to their weight. You know, when it comes to risks and benefits, you know, we, we are responsible as physicians to explore and uh, explain risks and benefits, but the way I usually recommend it when I'm giving talks to, to primary care providers around obesity is, you can ask the patient really plainly, do you have any concerns about the impact of your weight on your health or your quality of life? They may say no, mm -hmm. in which case that's okay. 
you know, we don't judge or moralize around the person who who is not addressing one of their other risk factors. I mean, it's just a risk factor. It's not a guarantee. I appreciate the way he suggests primary care providers frame the conversation around obesity, leveraging test procedures and communication transparency to help broach the subject. Now, we as doctors can run tests. So you can run blood tests, take a look and see if they've got any conditions that might respond to weight loss. And then I think it'd be certainly reasonable to say, you know what? I noticed that your hemoglobin A1C is now in the pre-diabetes range. And certainly we know that a five, even a 5% weight loss can be beneficial. Is that something you'd like to discuss? They may say no, and that's okay. They are allowed to not want to discuss it. And I think that's all. We just need to be respectful of the fact that A, scales don't measure the presence or absence of health. And there's no question that at both extremes, very lightweights, very heavyweights, there's a lot of risk. Mm -hmm. They still aren't guarantees. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, if we've got a medical reason to discuss it, great. We can discuss it in that context and ask the patient if they want to discuss it in that context. But we should never assume that the person with obesity is going to develop any problems. And we shouldn't assume that they necessarily are affected by it from a quality of life perspective. We can literally ask and respect the answer. Now, before we go further, I'd also like to draw attention to his usage of people first language as it pertains to this disease. Several times you've heard him say, a person with obesity instead of obese person. I'll let him explain why this is a very important distinction and why it matters. People first language just is the notion that a disease does not define an individual does not define who they are or what they are. So it's important for almost all chronic medical conditions and disease. A person <laughs> is not described as obese. It's not an obese person. It's a person who has obesity. There's a big difference there, especially when it comes to obesity, where there's so many negative connotations associated with the word and the condition in society. To describe people as obese or morbidly obese, it leads to stereotype and stigma. Uh, and certainly I think reinforces stereotype and stigma. People are not their medical conditions. We don't describe people as being cancerous. They are people who have cancer. Language shapes impressions of things in a big way. If someone is obese, it suggests that's a choice. If they have obesity, I think it suggests that it's just something that they have. Yeah. And, uh, and that they're not choosing it for themselves. Yanni goes on to mention two communities who do not prefer people first language, namely the deaf community and the autistic community. I definitely agree that the choice should be made by those within the community. As it pertains to obesity, he acknowledges that there may be some pushback, but his choice is informed by both community involvement and research. Certainly the various patient advocacy organizations out there for working with people with obesity prefer people first language. Uh, the research on stigma and language would suggest it's valuable as well. And I think it's just good practice for us as clinicians. I hope you're beginning to get a sense of the obesity landscape and how to traverse it with a sense of empathy and respect for those with the disease. Now, with Yanni as our guide, we'll explore the various avenues available to someone interested in losing weight for good and consider the concept of expectation therein. Let's start with lifestyle changes, nutrition, diet, and exercise. Through the lens of privilege, it is easy to see why many of the conversations around these topics fall short. To some degree, lifestyle is beyond our control as well. It really like, again, I know, I know people have this romantic notion, including people with obesity have this romantic notion that if you just want it badly enough, you'll make it happen. We're swimming against really strong currents here. That doesn't mean swimming lessons are a bad idea. I run a swimming lesson uh, uh, office, like that's what we do. Um, but it also means that we need to provide some tools beyond just how do you do the front crawl. Um, we need to provide life preservers and uh, and maybe jet skis and other things to help move people along because, again, this current is not one that we can modify just by wanting it to go away. It may be helpful here to pause the video for a moment and consider the ways in which privilege influences your lifestyle choices. You smell that? That's the smell of privilege. Put another way, in regards to lifestyle change, what choices are legitimately available to you? Sometimes I just come here and just realize that my life is so much better than everyone that shops at Ralph's. I think back to my youth as a first generation Canadian to Jamaican immigrants. They worked all day in a factory and at 5 p.m. when they got home, they would prepare something easy and fast while sacrificing nutrition or even just getting takeout. 
On weekends, when they had more time and energy, and later on in retirement, they would cook from scratch with natural ingredients. Obviously, time and energy were major factors in what my family ate, even beyond the financial considerations. And if we'd had Uber Eats back then, and they could have ordered dinner with one click of a button, I imagine they would have. So we ordered some uh, takeout from this restaurant here. It just opened. It's uh, Parayindi Parayayam Botania. It's a Jamaican infusion, whoa. And these are people who really know how to freaking cook. Chicken so nice and the chicken so sweet. Good healthy jerk chicken for all of us eat. When asked specifically about diet, Yanni had lots of important things to say. Does dietary choice have an impact? Sure. So that some foods are more sating, they're more filling than other foods. Uh, a calorie is not just a calorie from a health perspective or from a how hungry you're going to be later perspective. But I think those become rather esoteric discussions that again fall really into the laps of people with the greatest degree of privilege to pursue. When it comes to should we be encouraging or discouraging specific diets, I don't think there's anything wrong with people trying things on for size. I think it's important, however, for clinicians to counsel people into appreciating that if they don't like the diet or the life that they're living when they're losing their weight, they're probably going to gain it back when they decide they can't live with it anymore. You know, trying to help people figure out what is the healthiest life they can actually enjoy living is valuable. That might involve counseling around diet, but does it involve just prescribing a specific diet? No, probably the world's dumbest diets have some success stories. So, you know, I, I really do think it's not a bad thing for people to try different things on for size, but I'd be very leery and wary of any clinician who suggested there was only one right way to go that would work for everybody, because that's definitely not the case. When we look at studies of different diets, um, and waterfall plots. I love waterfall plots visually from a diet perspective. Basically, they show every single individual in, in the intervention and whether they lost or gained weight. What we see for pretty much every diet is that there's some people who do extremely well on it, some people who do mediocre, that's the, the majority of people, and some people actually gain. True to everything he's just said, here's how Yanni and his team approach nutrition and dieting in the clinic. I really appreciate the experimentation and collaborative effort. And so what we'll do is we'll work collaboratively with patients and they'll keep food diaries and we'll do experiments. And what we're trying to figure out is, you know, what pattern of eating, whether it's macronutrients, whether it's timing, you know, whatever, but what pattern of eating leaves you the most satisfied with the smallest amount of energy intake that you can actually enjoy and still indulge in like food and be a normal human being? That is an excellent question. And one that I will keep in mind next time someone asks me about dieting for weight loss. Then I asked Yanni to speak about the role of exercise in weight loss. And as you will see, he treats this topic in a similar fashion. I boil it down in my book to some is good, more is better and everything counts. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and that's the approach that I would recommend people take. I think it's a mistake to suggest there's best exercises, just like there's a mistake to suggest there's best diets. The goal is as much as a person can enjoyably sustain. Uh, if a person likes a particular thing and not another thing, I think trying to find ways to do more of the thing that you like is a good idea, even if there's benefits to the other thing as well. You know, I think about weights and cardio and weights, and some people love cardio, some people love weights. Um, you know, ideally, you want to be doing both and you want to be less sedentary overall, of course. But if you've got somebody who loves one, hates the other, you know, maybe spend more time cultivating the love of the one than worrying about trying to get them to do the thing that they hate. And as far as amounts go, there's been some some research I'm sure that you're familiar with as well that would suggest that people setting out to find small quantities of exercise multiple times a day often have an easier time accumulating exercise than the people trying to do the big bites. Love the way he approaches this as I'm a big fan of the movement snack. Now, again, we talk about privilege. My privilege is I've got a gym in my basement and I can go downstairs and my family's self-sustaining and I can do my workout in the morning and I'm done. But that's not the case for a lot of people. And the time involved in going to and from a gym, again, the money involved, the health involved, the social determinants involved, they're not small. And so, yeah, encouraging people to do whatever they can enjoy as much as they can enjoyably do it and also give them permission to have setbacks because no doubt whether it's injury or illness or travel or who knows what, it is going to fall apart. Yes, so please extend kindness to yourself when you 
fall off the wagon. Now, before we talk about pharmaceuticals and other support methods available to people with obesity, I think this is an excellent point to talk about expectation. In the next excerpt, Yanni is talking about expectation in regards to dietary lifestyle changes. But I'd wager to guess that the principle applies more broadly to other lifestyle changes as well. What it means is people with obesity don't end up as being people without necessarily the medical definition of obesity. Mm. You know, we're looking for total weight loss. And so the percentage of diets that lead to total weight loss, to normalizing one's weight, I'd say is very low, probably in that 95% or even worse realm. For context, he's speaking about a study I had presented in my first video that said that 95% of diets fail. Interestingly, when we interrogate the words success and failure as they pertain to dieting or other lifestyle changes, we find a very narrow definition of what it means to be successful, which is propagated by our societal biases about weight. And the societal sort of discourse around weight management actually dissuades people from trying to make changes and sustain them that might not lead them to some A plus amount of weight loss. If we look at what percentage of people can sustain a clinically meaningful weight loss, which may be 5% of a person's body weight or 10% of a person's body weight, the number is probably closer to the 30, 35% mark. And that's for all sorts of different diets. There's no best diet. I'm an egalitarian. If you like your diet and it's helping you maintain improvements to your health or your quality of life, we'll support you and just make sure you're medically safe and sound. Um, but going back to the question of success, it really is just where do you set your goalposts? The other goalposts that I think people never set and should is not gaining. Not gaining is a victory as well in this society, but nobody discusses it as victory rather than this belief that we need to all lose and lose lots in order for us to be determined or called a success story. Again, accepting reality where doesn't mean you can't affect weight loss and sustain it, but it might mean that no, you're not gonna go from a BMI of 40 to a BMI of 23 just because you really want to. Um, it, it, the, the likelihood is low. Those people exist, we've had them in our program. They're just so rare. And they're not rare because the people who didn't get there didn't want it as badly. It's because there are so many levers we just can't move. As Yanni outlined, there are many ways to define success and failure, but we live in a society that perpetuates biased and limited versions of them. An understanding of the depth and difficulty of what we are setting out to change will help sustain us as we continue to have these types of conversations and reassess our social and personal relationships to weight and the language surrounding it. People often try to change way too much at once, right? Yes. But really the easiest way to think about weight loss, the more weight that anybody wants to permanently lose, the more of life they have to permanently change. Mm. It's just respecting the fact that there will be things that are not changeable those genes and hormones, different medical issues, social determinants of health that aren't changeable, and some stuff that people won't want to change because food indeed is a pleasure and it is more than just sustenance. And so, you know, what it means is sure, there will be things that people can change that'll help them to lose weight, for sure, everybody, but there will also be things affecting weight that people either won't be able to change or they won't want to change which is why I think it's a mistake to set sort of pound-based weight loss goals for anybody. If you are going to make lifestyle changes, you will want to consider the size of the change and how difficult it may be for you to sustain it. This is also worth mentioning. If we're talking about primary care providers, I think lifestyle should be explored with every single patient regardless of their weight. I don't think a person's weight should determine whether there should be a discussion around food and fitness and cooking and eating, dis eating behaviors, etc. And I agree. Lifestyle factors strike me as an important tool within the toolkit, but he's right to say that they serve the same function in everyone's life regardless of their weight. To that point, this next piece of information is important. I usually tell patients that when we look at the, the outcomes of behavioral weight loss programs and interventions without medication, that people should be expecting that a weight loss of between 5 and 10% of their body uh, with medications, that goes up probably to 15 to 20%, especially with the newer meds that are coming on board. And with surgery, it's probably 25 to 30%. Those are averages. You know, people lose more and less than average. But 
I think averages are useful for expectation management for people. Next, I asked Yanni to speak directly about the role of pharmaceuticals in weight management. General question, what is the role of pharmaceuticals in the management of obesity? Same as the role of pharmaceuticals in the management of any chronic non-communicable disease. So, you know, I, I think it's a huge mistake to think of these as any different. You know, people have high blood pressure, for instance. There's lots of lifestyle things people can do that in many cases will help. And people could go on low sodium diets and exercise sleep, lose weight, meditate. But doctors don't moralize, nor do patients, around whether they should or shouldn't do that. You show up in your doctor's office with high blood pressure, part of the discussion, not the whole discussion, but part of it, is going to be meds. Here are the meds. Here's what they do. I think our job as physicians, and I think the job of these medications fits right into it, is to provide patients with information about their different options. So included in those options for people who qualify from a medical need perspective, so body mass index of 27 with medical issues related to weight or body mass index of 30 without, uh, they are candidates for medication and they should be discussed with people. Uh, people who have a body mass index of 35 and above with medical comorbidities or 40 and above without, they should have a discussion about surgery. It's not our job to decide for patients what they should do. It's our job to tell people what are the options. And the meds now are pretty damn good. While there are great pharmaceutical options available, Yanni goes on to explain the stigma surrounding medication in relation to obesity. So one of the things that I see a lot in weight management is people talking about, you know, do I need to be on a medication forever for weight management? Because there are useful meds now. And one of the knocks is we need to be on it forever. And it's, it's funny because I, I explain that if you have a chronic medical condition, and you stop treatment, there are no temporary treatments for long-term conditions. Mm -hmm. The new generation of drugs, they're extremely well tolerated. Um, they're leading people to weight losses, certainly in the double digits, often, you know, 15% or more. Some are really strong responders losing surgical amounts of weight loss. And suddenly, people who are on these meds, they tell me very plainly, like, this is how I wanted to feel in the sense that they're not fighting the current of hunger and cravings and fullness, because that's what these drugs work on. Mm -hmm. And suddenly left without the sort of genetic physiologic push towards more and different choices, they are very much able to navigate the world in a way that keeps them uh, consuming less, liking what their li their life is like with less and not regaining their weight. So the, that's a long answer for me to say that our job is to tell people what their options are. And finally, we have great pharmaceutical options. And being on one does not mean you're failing. And by the way, you can be on a great pharmaceutical option and still focus on lifestyle change and probably should if you're able to, uh, mm -hmm. just like every other chronic medical condition we have. But we only moralize about this one. I mentioned to Yanni that I have seen people using Ozempic to effectively lose large amounts of weight. And he was able to expand my focus to consider how a person feels when they take a specific medication. An important and easily overlooked part of the conversation. What's remarkable about these meds is that it takes away the fight that people have been taught to believe was their own personal failure. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. is empowering. It helps people's mental health, their brain space to not have that sort of, oh my God, it's it's just, I don't want it badly enough. I'm not trying enough. And no, it's just that we don't have gauges on our arms for our hormones and gut peptides. If we did, we'd be hungry making weird choices and we'd look at our arm with the gauge and say, oh, it's because my GLP-1 levels are low or because my, you know, my ghrelin is high and that's why I'm eating this way. But without those gauges, what do we do? We tend to default into thinking this is a choice we're making personally, whether it's for mood or whether it's for boredom or whether it's for whatever, when really it's just we've got a current that we now are starting to be able to turn down or turn off, you know, and so I, I'm thrilled that we have them. I've been doing this job for 20 years. I wish we had them 20 years ago, but uh, but it's a great thing. And I think it will erode a lot of societal weight bias, you know, we saw that to some degree with uh, mental health and medications that were used there. There was a time where people just were thought to not be trying hard enough with their mental health. That is not a common belief anymore. And the idea that people can get prescriptions for their mental health, for depression, for anxiety, for whatever, is no longer a, 
it doesn't have the negative connotations it did even 30 or 40 years ago. And I suspect it'll be the same for obesity 30 or 40 years from now. Over the course of our conversation, Yanni really helped me to expand my thinking in regards to obesity and the conversations that are had surrounding it. With the advent of effective medication and a deeper understanding of lifestyle change and how to approach them, I am optimistic about the progress we have made and will continue to make. One more word from Dr. Yanni Friedhoff. All this to say is I'm really thrilled that we actually have treatments that go beyond lifestyle for weight management now, just like we do for a very large majority of other chronic non-communicable conditions and diseases. I'm happy to be having this discussion, I'm enjoying it, but I will say that I would be surprised if there'd be an interest in this discussion in 20 or 30 years from now, mm. because I think by then there will be a lot more understanding and acceptance of this is not a choice. Mm. There's meds that help, people are on them, they're doing great, and uh, I, I look forward to, to that time. Um, hopefully, I'll still be around to see it, but but I really do believe that we're going that way. I've been, again, I've been doing this 20 years. We wouldn't have had this discussion 20 years ago either. 20 years ago, we were in a place where nobody was talking about this stuff. Uh, there was no interest in hearing about it. It was only the possibility that people were morally failing themselves, and that's why they had this problem. And so the fact that we're now at a place where we're discussing it, that's progress. And I think there'll still be more progress. So if you are concerned about losing weight for good, this is certainly what you need to know right here. But you tell me, did you agree with Dr. Friedhoff? And if you did, then let me know down below and don't forget to subscribe. If you didn't, then tell me why in the comments section. And also let me know if you are digging this video interview mashup style too. Oh, and don't forget to tip the team. As always, that's been a word from Dr. Chris, not your everyday ortho, where we see one, do one, teach one.